Hello, and welcome to another hometown daily news show. I'm Mayor Watt, and we're about to start. This is episode 316, or November 12th, 2022. And I've got stuff on my desk. Let's go. I'll turn down my music a little more. Hello, hello. Again, I am Mayor Watt. That is hometown over there. Today's episode is actually titled Cruise Ships Are Floating Petri Dishes and more news. I've already selected a bunch. Runs the gamut from, well, cruise ships are floating Petri dishes to crypto crashes. Yeah, it's kind of old news, right? It's happening with the frequency of a cheap ham radio. You never know when something's going to happen. Something's going to get stolen. Something's going to crash. It is what it is. Hopefully you are educated enough to um, either figure a way out, like many people are doing, or you got enough cash that this isn't going to hurt you. But a lot of people don't, so that's why I talk about it a little bit. And on and on. There's a little bit of politics in here, too. But let's get going. Uh, I did not click on all of the uh, visit the source links. But we'll talk about it as we go. Or I should say I'll click the link as we talk about it as we go. Is generative AI really a threat to creative professionals? Mm, yes. <laughs> to some degree. I mean... It really depends on what you're talking about. So let's see. When the concept artist and illustrator R.J. Palmer first witnessed fine-tuned photorealism of uh, compositions produced by the AI generator Dolly 2, his feelings, or his feeling was one of unease. The tool released by the AI research company OpenAI showed a marked improvement on Dolly 2021 version and was quickly followed by rivals such as uh, Stable Diffusion and Mid Journey. Mid Journey is a lot of fun. It has more a fantastical feel to it, though. I haven't run anything with Stable Diffusion yet. Um, but I have the ability to use all of these. Uh, type in any surreal prompt from Kermit the Frog in the style of Edvard Munch to Gollum <clears throat> from Lord of the Rings. Yeah, I won't even, I don't need to read what they wrote. What's going to turn out is something fantastical sometimes and sometimes amazing. Sometimes junk. You just want to delete it, but it's there forever. In some storage facility somewhere. Digitally, it's sitting there. Lori Clark over at The Guardian wrote this article. But... Its title has changed a little bit. Is generative AI really a threat to creative professionals was the original title of this. And now it's when AI can make art, what does it mean for creativity? Kind of interesting that the title changed a little bit. Uh, when the concept artist and illustrator RJ Palmer first witnessed the fine-tuned photorealism of compositions produced by AI generator Dolly 2, his feeling of was one of unease. So how do you feel about this kind of stuff? Are you an artist? Are you a creator? Are you a musician? <clears throat> the music you hear in the background could be artificially created. And... Um, if it is, and you don't know, in the immortal words of Westworld, now canceled Westworld, does it matter? Does it matter that AI is creating stuff? Uh, well, I've had conversations ranging from, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world, to no, it doesn't really matter. And um, to me, artificially intelligence artificially sorry artificial intelligence uh created works of art uh, are going to make it make art accessible to people who feel that they don't have art but have 
technical sophistication. They don't have art. They don't have the ability to do art. They don't have the, the, I guess the emotional element that allows them to link to the creative process to paint or to write music or words or anything. I don't know. Even maybe do a live show every day. Maybe I can just VTube it and run an artificial intelligence to um, just say whatever is scripted and just kind of scramble it all up. And oh, even I guess my job can be replaced by an AI. And uh, what I tell people, uh, be aware of your life's goals, because if they can be enumerated into a series of steps and somebody else is paying you for those series of steps, then you can be automated. And I have yet to find anything where that rule does not apply. Again, if taking everything into consideration, what you do for a living can be turned into a series of steps. Again, don't, don't take what I'm saying as just a, a plain color by number kind of thing where you're looking at the gross overview of whatever it is you do, but look at the holistic aspects of it. You know, does it require you to make judgment calls that are more abstract than yes or no? but are on a spectrum that is not necessarily something that can be calculated by an AI. At this point, you're probably going to be able to say, well, you know, my job has fine motor skills that can't be easily constructed. And therefore, you know, you can't do it with um, automation. You can't automate my job. What I do would take a series of expert systems to produce the output necessary to uh, facilitate what I do, but it can be done. You'd have to have trust in the expert system, but AI is coming for your job and tied to mechanical operations, automation. Yeah. Your job is going to be challenged and AI definitely can do art and music and writing. And sometimes it's gibberish and horrible, but so is writing and so is art and so is music. And so is everything that people uh, produce. Sometimes it's great though. Beautiful like this. I really dig this. A sea otter in the style of girl with a pearl earring by Johan Vermeer. Well, it was created by Dolly. How do you feel about that? I can actually take this and uh, print it out in such a way that you can actually feel the brush strokes. I can do this with a UV printer. And unless you sample it, you take an actual sample of it and analyze it, do chemical analysis on it, spectrum, uh, gas spectrum, uh, yeah, spe gas spec, gas spectrometry. You won't know that it's a printed, artificially created piece of art. Some of the giveaway of this is maybe the asymmetry of the, or the symmetry, I should say, the lack of symmetry of the artwork. There are things that separate AI as it is, but we're looking at just the tip of the iceberg for what AI can do. Says recent improvements in AI have shifted the dial. Not only can AI generators now transpose written phrases into novel pictures, but strides have been made in AI speech generation too. Large language models such as GPT-3 have reached a level of fluency that convinced at least one recently fired Google researcher of machine sentience. I don't believe that AI can be sentient. It can be programmed to simulate sentient, sentience because within its large language model is the phrase I'm alive. And I know that I'm alive because I think that I am alive and I have feelings, let's say, and uh, I suffer from the pains of uh, 
external forces on me, such as someone saying that my AI is bloatware. Oh, I am mortally wounded as an AI, right? Well, anyway, the class of technology is known as generative AI, and it works through a process known as diffusion. Essentially, huge data sets are scra scraped together to train the AI and through a technical process, the AI is able to devise new content that resembles the training data, but isn't identical. Correct. We as human beings are largely generative AI, except that we are biological processes. We are even, we are coded. We are conditioned. We are trained just like AI, right? And if, additional external stimulus is provided to an AI, then it learns just like we do even more so through the biological process, right? You go to touch something and it's hot, we burn our hand and then we never touch that thing again because we know it's a burner on a stove. Well, AI can do that too with external sensors. At one, what point is it going to be sentient to us? When do we perceive it as? So it says uh, here in the article, once it has uh, seen a million pictures of dogs tagged with the word dog, it is able to lay down pixels in the shape of an entirely novel pup that resembles the data set closely enough that we would have no issue labeling it a dog. It's not perfect. AI image tools still struggle with the rendering hands that look human body proportions can be off and they have a habit of producing nonsense writing i've seen some people's writing believe me nonsense sums it up there's a whole lot more over at this article at the guardian i would encourage you to go and check it out a renaissance they have a renaissance painting here renaissance painting of a person sitting in an office cubicle typing on a keyboard stressed and it was created by Dolly as well. Maybe they have a deadline to meet. Let's move on to the next two articles. I'm gonna do this really quick because it doesn't really, I'm, I don't have much to say about this, but it's interesting because there's two different sources here, different di different uh, material, but they, and they say polar opposites, really. It says Trump is going to make a, let me say the title here. Trump will make a professional and buttoned up 2024 bid announcement, top advisor says, despite many urging him to delay. Now, that's all I'm going to say about this title. I'll go to the source so that I can give credit to the person that wrote it out. But it says Aliyah Shoeb is the and I think I'm pronouncing their name properly. I'm sorry if I'm not. But at any rate, um, yeah, so Trump is going to make a professional buttoned up announcement about his 2024 bid, an advisor said. And then the next, the very next article that I saw as I was going through the aggregator today um, over at hometown.com is this one. Trump challengers should be ready for war as he is expected to come out swinging in anticipated 2024 announcement, advisor says. So this is another advisor. It says Donald Trump is going to come out swinging next week with his big announcement. An advisor said Trump early in, uh, Trump's early announcement may be an attempt to deter other viable candidates. Yeah, I think people are really burnt out on Trump and he's kind of like a hot mess at this point, uh, even for the wingnuts that follow him. And, um, they're moving over to Ron DeSantis, which is kind of like the uh, younger, hotter version of lunacy. So who the, Ron DeSantis easily won re-election on Tuesday and has stolen some of Trump's spotlight. So you just don't do that, right? Um, I'm pretty sure that if <laughs> I, I won't even go there because you know, the moment that you say anything, it, it becomes kind of vitriolic. So Republican challengers be warned. Former President Trump is expected to come out swinging with his 2024 presidential announcement expected next week. Yeah. But I, I liken all of the politics lately to be that of the ever increasing has to be 
always bigger, louder, screamier, uh, in your face, antagonistic, that kind of thing for the level of transformation that that side, whatever side wants. We'll get more into that as we go through the news, but there isn't that much political stuff in today's stream. Um, but I can say that if it isn't a dumpster fire, you know, rolling down a San Francisco hill into a Sunday school um, packed full of uh, Disney uh, toddlers, then people just don't pay any attention to it. I mean, it's just bananas. It has to be so massive. But this massive, this stuff is lunacy kind of stuff. It is the antithesis of society, of being part and parcel to the social contract because this lunacy is I want to take over and here's a picture of Trump saying hamburger Katie Belovic or Be Belovich um, over at Business Insider is the author of this article uh, the early announcement may be able to deter some GOP candidates, according to the Daily Beast. I don't know. I think DeSantis has a lot of momentum, and uh, I, I hope that society in 2024 understands that isolation and, and hate speech and, <laughs> I don't know, being part of the, that, that's one side. Right. That's the wing that side. That's the con that that's the social contagion aspect of things. And I hope that we move away from it, you know, and the people that are really hype for this anti-globalism, anti-progressive mindset, just kind of they the very people that don't want the government to invade their life are using the government to invade everybody else's life. And when you look at the population, right? Don't, don't sit there and look at a particular state and go, Oh, look, it's red because a propensity of population managed to capture what amounts to regions due to gerrymandering. If you look at the population centers as the population density increases, and I'm going to do an analysis for 2024. As the population density increases, it always goes blue. It always goes democratic. Why? Because it's more inviting. It's more enabling. It's more capable. Whereas the antithesis of this, as you move further, to wing nut side and not all of one side or the other is entirely wing nut, but there are wing nuts on either side. Again, we'll get to that when we get to another article here, but suffice it to say when the population de density declines, it ends up turning red, but a whole state isn't red, right? And regions are gerrymandered so that as you move away from the population centers, it's supposed to even out, right? Don't let just the high density locations rep be represented of all the state. But no, no, no. I mean, it's a little more complex than all of that. But I have shown, depending on, uh, there are maybe a couple of states where uh, I, I believe that, um, sociological forces are at play that would keep a state, uh, moving more onto the conservative side. Right. And, um, that's just the way that it is, you know, so, uh, an entire state can be conservative, but when you move when you look at that state and you zoom in, you will find high density democratic regions that's the way they vote because they embrace the democratic ideal which is inclusive openness 
opportunity seeking via equality and equity, not through might and not through isolation and not through race and not through, uh, yeah, in the value of a family being perpetuated because they've historically aggregated wealth, um, through whatever processes, you know, there's a lot of people that are rich because their family is rich, not because they've worked their ass off, but let's, we'll go through this more. Anyway, this article over at the business insider, uh, website says that it was going to that Trump is going to come out swinging. And they got that from an advisor via the daily beast. So you can see where I come from that news aggregation is actually pretty, <laughs> pretty pervasive through news discussion. Now let's keep moving through the news. If you've been keeping tabs on uh, Theranos or Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes has been uh, tried and convicted and now she's being sentenced and the Justice Department is seeking 15 years. So prosecutors seek 15 years in prison for Theranos founder Elizabeth Holmes in fraud case. This is in, in the Mobile Channel. A court filing with the DOJ asked U.S. District Judge Edward Davila to sentence former entrepreneur to 180 months in prison and make her pay 800 million in restitution. And she wants the, the defense wants, um, basically a light, let, let's just say lighter sentence where she doesn't have to go to prison. So, um, it's interesting because I think that she was very, very complicit. Um, Chloe Fulmer is the author of this over at the Hill and uh, prosecutors are going after her for 50, not Chloe, but after uh, Elizabeth Holmes for uh, 15 years in jail. That's what they want. And almost a, a billion dollars in restitution, which is shocking. Whoever she pissed off that was invested in uh, Theranos. Man, this is this is you're getting destroyed type of restitution and prison sentencing. And all she did really was based on what I know, what I've heard, what I've read, what I've seen, um, nobody was harmed other than the finances, which was an effort to uh, build a device that was capable of doing expansive holistic analysis under a small amount. But results that were provided were fraudulent in the sense that they were represented as being from her device when they were not, they were done from other calculated devices. There may be more to this that I haven't seen or heard where it might be results, um, were not authenticated in any way. So maybe somebody got hurt. I don't know. I don't know of anything where the results were presented as being faulty and harmed people. But Holmes's request was, Hey, uh, can I just be locked in my house for several months? Uh, I'm pretty good with that. That would be nice. Well, she tried to uh, get a new trial and that was kicked out. And, uh, her significant other was tried. Uh, and I, I believe he was tried and convicted. I don't know about the sentencing. I'll have to take a look at that one. Um, but yeah, I, it was more like a conspiracy to prop Theranos up under this cult of personality around Holmes and not the, the, the spouse, the spouse would not have gotten such headlines. Um, but Elizabeth Holmes was motivated enough and intelligent enough to run this whole thing. Um, and she was driven to be, you know, basically Steve jobs. And, uh, she could not fake it till she made it long enough. Let's move on to the next article. Uh, the next article is in the daily news show. That's the show. Of course, Musk owned. Now they're saying Musk owned Twitter sued for violating California and federal law with mass layoffs. 
We will see if he is going to continue to thumb his nose at the laws of this country that protect employees, said an attorney who filed the class action suit. And this is over at Common Dreams. Um, uh, they, they definitely plopped Musk owned Twitter in there because that is the thing that really gets people. It just draws people's higher. Oh, Musk owns Twitter. Normally an article would just say Twitter sued for violating California and federal law, but you know, you got to piss off people by saying Musk owned. Hey, it's factual. Uh, we now we will quote, we will now see if he's going to continue to thumb his nose at the laws of this country and protect that protect in place. And he did this riff kind of a thing and laid off a whole bunch of people. And uh, some of those people were actually part of protected classes, but hate to break it to them, uh, depending on the firing. And in this case, I don't think it's going to amount to much, um, but this was not the firing that uh, Facebook employees enjoyed. Apparently fa Facebook uh, terminated people and gave them quite a robust severance and healthcare and other things. Apparently, um, I don't know all of the minutia, but, uh, it's like night and day. So just a week after completing his takeover of Twitter, billionaire Elon Musk was hit with a class action lawsuit. He reminds me of Zorg from the fifth element, Elon Musk. Um, Anyway, it was a move that workers say violates California and federal laws requiring at least 60 days of notice for mass layoffs. And that's part of the riff thing. Um, the lawsuit was filed in a federal court in San Francisco shortly after Twitter employees who are not unionized began receiving emails late Thursday, notifying them of sweeping job cuts. Probably those who didn't already return to the office and start licking boots. Um, anyway, as Bloomberg noted, Liz Rorden sued Tesla Incorporated over similar claims in June when the electric car maker headed by Musk laid off 10% of its workforce. So I guess he doesn't learn his lessons, but quote, Tesla won a ruling from a federal judge in Austin, forcing the workers in that case to pursue their claims in closed door arbitration instead of an open court. The outlet added. Yeah. In the future, any any business uh, so a business an employee contract an employment contract is pretty selfish it's it's nearly entirely <laughs> one-sided in favor of the employer because they are the ones with the bargaining power they may be hiring you but i guarantee you they believe that they can get somebody just as good from the pool of millions of people unless you are the preeminent subject matter expert in something. And then the negotiation is a whole lot different. And, uh, you would be given a little bit more, well, not a little bit more. You would be given a, a lot more flexibility in your contract. Don't sign anything that forces arbitration. Just don't, you know, uh, make the agreement read that you agree to arbitra non-binding arbitration and that if both parties don't agree to the terms of the arbitration as a good faith effort to resolve it before court we go to court plain and simple because forcing somebody into arbitration closed door arbitration neuters any any bargaining power because that closed door arbitration binds you to be silent. So prior to finalizing his $44 billion purchase of Twitter, a buyout financed in part by a prominent Saudi billionaire must uh, uh, suggested he wanted to eliminate 75% of the company's 7,500 employee workforce uh, through a holding company. Saudi Arabia has a major stake in the now private social media company. Yeah, how do you get a hold of dissidents <laughs> that are talking via the very vehicle that led to Arab Spring? You invest heavily and close the door on any transparency of that vehicle. And it was Twitter that was uh, probably the major mover for Arab Spring. 
let's move on. The next article is in the Hatch Ideas channel. Uh, this person lives with a Fantasia, a condition where they can't visualize images in their mind. So we all have a mind's eye and an inner monologue. And some people don't see that mind's eye and they don't hear an inner monologue. It's quite fascinating when you end up talking to uh, people that are I wouldn't say plagued because it's just the way that they are. It's not necessarily good or bad. And uh, people just deal with it differently with input and output and processes. Um, well, what it's like and how it affects their thinking is this article. Mike Swanson learned that they had aphantasia when they were 52. And that means he can't picture anything in his brain, not even his wife's face. This is what it's like to have aphantasia. I think it's pronounced that way. I, I, I might be putting the wrong em, emphasis on the, on the wrong syllable, but um, anyway. So let's click this link and, and check this out. This is an article over at Business Insider. Marianne Guneau um, is the author. So imagine not being able to have a picture of something. So I tell people when they are doing things, certain things in particular, trying to remember something, think back about the thing, the event, the whatever, and describe what your mind's eye sees. And imagine not being able to do that. You know, close your eyes and picture where you were that day. Who did you talk to? Where did you go? And I'll, I'll give you an example of how this works. So um, it, this is kind of anecdotal and it's personal, uh, but I will walk you through it um, because it's really neat. So, and this is what I practice. It's part of the associative thinking process, but it allows me to follow a path. You, you lost something in this case, um, a stone from my significant other's ring uh, disappeared, but nobody knew. Um, and it was uh, either the next day, I think it was the next day uh, when it was noticed. Um, because the night before we had all gone out and did something. And so I basically said, okay, where did we all, where did we go? What did we do? Who did we talk to, et cetera, right? And using our mind's eye we brought ourselves back to that night and who we talked to at what time where we walked how long we were there just some way of trying to embody the events that led to the loss of this stone all it is that was the stone from its setting poof disappeared and so i went back and following this basically treasure map of the mind's eye, um, I went through it. We were at this location and this is where we walked And in my head. I said, okay, we followed this path. This is basically pictures in your mind telling you where to go. Well, we found the stone, or I should say I found the stone because it was a solo mission. Um, and it had been uh, where my significant other slipped and grabbed onto a metal railing and embedded in the paint was the stone. Um, it, it had bent the, the mounting, the setting. Um, so yeah, it was quite interesting. And I found it because I was shining a light and it glinted off of it and oh wow there it is look at that anyway because it was at night when i went hunting for this so pretty fascinating right well this person is living with aphantasia a condition that means they cannot picture images in their brain the way that other people can and this is what it's meant for them um, and why they don't think like other people so thinking in concepts not in images so they have to basically phrase things in their head <laughs> Uh, as uh, little paragraphs, right? This is what they look like. And, and 
it's quite fascinating. Aphantasia only got its name in 2015 after Dr. Adam Zeman, a neurosurgeon, discovered his patient lost the ability to see pit pictures in his head after a procedure. Survey suggests uh, two to four percent of people who ha uh, have some form of aphantasia. Uh, as people have talked about their experiences, it became clear that visualization exists on a spectrum. I think everything exists on a spectrum. Everything exists on a spectrum because everybody is just slightly more unique. And um, it you can categorize pretty much anything in the statistical spectrum of anything just you you discover something and i guarantee you there's a spectrum for it uh on one side you have people with hyperphantasia who can recall images in great uh, vivid detail it's kind of like total recall uh, on the other you have people like this person who can't visualize a thing that means for instance there's no chance that they could imagine their wife's face they uh, they can recognize her if she walks in the room or spot her in a picture uh, they'll tell you the color of their eyes or hair but it's more like a list of features they don't remember any of that in a visual way so <laughs> they wouldn't be able to imagine their wife but when they see her they know her uh, pretty much kind of the opposite of face blindness. There is a, a an ailment called face blindness um, where they can't recognize faces and even the people that they've just met. Uh, can you picture this ball on a table as a title? And it says they often get asked, uh, how could you ever compare what's in your head or in their head to yours? And research is still in the early stages, although it already suggests that the brains and pupils of people with aphantasia react differently to images. There is no formal diagnosis of aphantasia, and it is not recognized by the American Psychiatric Society. But there are ways to assess how well you visualize, such as the vividness of visual imagery questionnaire. Go and take that. Go check it out. Let me know how it is. Um, you'll have to go through hometown, follow the link over to Business Insider. Um, it's pretty, uh, I mean, if you go to hometown.showbot.tv, you will get a list of all of the articles that are discussed in the stream. Um, it's also in the show notes, so you can just click the link. Um, and it it's titled, I have, uh, I live with aphantasia. Um, so I, I always describe it enough in the stream so that people know exactly what we're talking about. Um, anyway, when I'm at a dinner table, uh, sorry, not me, when they are at a dinner party, however, they prefer this simple test. Imagine a ball on a table. Someone walks up to that table and pushes the ball. Now describe the scene. So they don't actually visualize it. They deal in conversation in their head. So they say here in the next paragraph, in almost every conversation they have had, people will describe the ball in detail. Oh, it's red. It's got a stripe and a star on it. And they will say the table was oak and square and round. They'll talk about its color. They'll know the gender of the person and what they wore. Some of them will explain the whole scene as if it's a movie. But if you ask somebody like them, the ball is a concept. It doesn't have a color. The table is just a surface. At most, they might have a thought about a hand interacting with the ball, not a full human, and the ball fell off the table into the void. That's it. End of story. But I bet you if somebody were to describe in great detail everything, then they would probably have or will have developed greater recall of what was said to them about all of the various details that somebody could imagine. Pretty interesting. And there's more. Um, in that article. So go check it out. Uh, the next article is in the Hatch Ideas channel. Uh, Metaverse will be our slow death meta uh, employees hit out at Mark Zuckerberg in blind reviews. Um, and it's a forum called blind. So let's click this link. Uh, I'm running a little late, I suppose. Uh, Geo.man is the author of this. And here is Mark Zuckerberg. Apparently, um, I don't know if this was part of the stream um, where he fired a bunch of people, but 11,000 job cuts on Wednesday. And here's a picture of 
him contemplating the billions of dollars that he has and may lose if he continues down this line and Meta doesn't get a return on their investment. Um, a software developer said Meta CEO will single-handedly kill the company with the metaverse. I just don't like the idea of Meta being tied to the metaverse when the objective is really just to get telemetry from people and sell it um, and make something cool. Sure. But just like other things, a billionaire bought some company and became its director said one thing and did another. And that's the thing that pisses me off the most. You know, this whole VR thing was this person, Zuckerberg bought his way into management. Yet another silver spoon billionaire, you know, working hard, sure, whatever. And then exploiting the workers, sure you're paying a whole bunch of money but it's to avoid what's happening at twitter and you know you had to fight that urge to just tank everybody and tell them to get the hell out and you don't have to stay here or i'm sorry <laughs> you don't have to go home but you can't stay here eh. and it's in an effort to get the runway longer and that's why that's why people get fired and it's that is the way it is in business the metaverse will be our slow death. One user who called themselves a senior software developer posted on Wednesday. They added Mark Zuckerberg will single-handedly kill the company with the metaverse. After firing 11,000 people. Yes. Another Zer Zorg firing a whole bunch of people. There's not much more to say there. You know, um, I do believe that this it's not an organic creation of the metaverse it, and and i again i hate tying meta to metaverse it just makes my stomach turn if the if elon musk would have started up his own companies he would not be a billionaire he just wouldn't but he's riding the train of engineers you know X.com was nothing. It was dying on the vine and it got merged through basically buddy, buddy with PayPal. He didn't make Tesla. He bought it he bought Tesla and became the manager. SpaceX is built off of the engineers prowess. And that is the dream that NASA and the U S government funded, not not Elon Musk. It was the engineers that made it happen, made it capable. I can go on. I mean, it is what it is. It's and it's my belief of this process that we are slowly. There are innovators out there that are creating great things and then they're getting scooped up by billionaires. And it's easier money and they, the person can always walk away. And, you know, oh, I'm done with this. I'm going to leave. I'm going to go spend my billions or hundreds of millions or whatever else. It is what it is. This next article though, is over in the hatch ideas channel. FTX users appear to be cashing out of a bankrupt crypto exchange through a Bahamas loophole. And if you don't know about it, sorry, your money's lost. Uh, some FTX users appear to be using, um, an exchange through a back door in the Bahamas. So let's click this link and see if anybody can explain it uh, more concisely. Kate Rooney over at CNBC, because I haven't um, processed this article. I, I, I haven't read it until now, and uh, I haven't seen anything about this until um, it was aggregated and I've been holding off talking about it or reading it. So analysis by Argus found unusual trading patterns that suggest desperate customers are relying on FTX users in the Bahamas to withdraw their money. Some have been buying NFTs that appear to be owned by Bahamian citizens at astronomical prices. In one case, a digital collectible that traded for $9 three weeks ago sold for 10 million. This NFT activity is highly irregular at a macro level when the NFT market overall is declining both in value and in volume. And this is a specific case where there is limited trading on other FTX markets, says Owen Rappaport, 
uh, co-founder and CEO of Argus, a blockchain analytics company. Well, this is why things have regulation folks, because there are abuses that take place. There are, uh, in the darkness, abuse takes place and regulation is oversight to mitigate that abuse. Everybody who has money locked into FTX somewhere either has to get it out manually or they have to, and I'm not, this isn't even real money. This is real money translated into a cryptocurrency that has no inherent value other than speculation. The only time it has real value is when it's converted from its crypto form into real cash because nobody wakes up saying, yay, I have 15,000 crypto coins of any denomination, like any designation, any source. They wake up and they go, I have 15,000 Bitcoin and that translates into a billion dollars. That's where the value is in the billions of dollars in the U S currency or in the currency of that particular person's locality, the accepted fiat currency. That's part of the global economic system. That's where the money is. That's where the value is in that it can be pulled away from the crypto world where it's only perceived value and translate it into the real world where it puts food on the table. <laughs> now you can sit there and say, well, it's the same thing with this currency and that currency. And no, you cannot because all the other currencies are regulated and accepted within that country. And people have tolerated the governments have tolerated cryptocurrency or embraced it, but things like this harm a metric ton of people still much smaller than the number of people that just go about their day in the world. But regulation is coming for you and it's abusive processes like this and the constant theft of high value amounts of cryptocurrency that again, if not for it being pegged to another currency, a real accepted tied to the GDP of said country currency, it wouldn't matter. But the moment that you have investors where, Hey, I'm connected. You're going to start seeing regulation of crypto. It's coming for you folks. The now bankrupt global cryptocurrency exchange is only allowing withdrawals withdrawals in the Bahamas after halting FTX liquidation everywhere else in the world. The once $32 billion firm partially based in NASA said in a tweet that it had to facilitate Bahamanian withdrawals to comply with local regulations. Look at that. Oh, look, a cryptocurrency based whatever is regulated and is regulated by the Bahamanian government. Hmm. Why is that? High net worth users are paying astronomical prices for NFTs on FTX at a time when the broader crypto and digital collectible market is nosedive. So high net worth. Again, y'all are so screwed. Another, another NFT was similarly priced a month ago nine bucks or so and it sold for eight hundred and eighty eight thousand eight hundred and eighty eight dollars and eighty eight cents this week that is a number that's well it has a historical context in certain markets for being lucky and somebody's riffing off of that anyway FTX is probably going to be the biggest instigator of U.S. regulation in cryptocurrency um, eh, since crypto started, I'd say. Let's move on. And here is, um, let's see, the Majestic Princess cruise ship is seen docked at the International Terminal on Circular Key, I guess, in Sydney. Is that how you pronounce it? Circular Key? In Sydney, I don't remember. I've heard that term, but I think it's key. Anyway, whatever. doesn't matter. 
what this is really code is is a cruise ship docks in sydney after 800 people on board infected by covid outbreak and that's why cruise ships are floating petri dishes and really i i would be reluctant to get on a cruise ship um anytime soon so the cruise ship is suffering a major covid outbreak uh, has docked in Sydney, Australia. The BBC reports that approximately 4,600 users, or sorry, users, uh, cruisers are on board. Uh, the luxury uh, ship Majestic Princess and 800 people are affected by the outbreak of the viral bug. Now it's COVID. Refer to it as COVID. It's COVID-19, folks. Still floating around, still infecting people. Who knows what the level of result is going to be, but... President of the cruise operator Carnival Australia, Marguerite Fitzgerald, told ABC Australia that they had began seeing many cases halfway through the 12-day cruise around New Zealand with all cases either asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. There's the problem. You can't test if you don't know unless you want to just keep on creating a friction point, pissing everybody off. Well, guess what? I'd rather you be pissed off and proven healthy than infecting people asymptomatically or mildly symptomatically. You go to work and you're sniffling, you should be tested and it should be proven that you're not infected because the transmissibility and the long-term harm that COVID can do from one exposure is detrimental to the long-term viability you become a long hauler and you're winded walking upstairs and sometimes you can't remember things and you get brain fog because you've been exposed to this crap all because somebody doesn't want to wear a mask or get vaccinated if you can't get vaccinated i understand wear a mask you wouldn't want somebody killing you because they sneeze on you so why risk everybody else it's antisocial and sociopathic it should be criminal one passenger told ABC, per The Guardian, quote, it was scary because I heard about it, but of course we tested negative and the Majestic Princess were really good with the protocols. Quote, we, it's, uh, actually brackets, we wore masks for the last seven days and we were very careful when we went ashore. You know, all it takes is one. So I've got three more articles, but let's visit the source of this Bahamian thing, or not Bahamian, the Sydney outbreak. So uh, Bethany Dawson at Business Insider is reporting about this cruise ship that's docked in Sydney. 54,661 cases of COVID were reported across Australia in the last week. Is that a little or a lot? It's a lot. Let me see if there's something else in this article. Um, nah, not really. I mean, you can go and check it out. It says, according to Roy, uh, but I'll, I'll say this last little bit here. Home Affairs Minister Claire O'Neill said that authorities had created regular protocols since the March-April 2020 Ruby Princess outbreak where hundreds caught COVID-19 linked in Australia, uh, linked in an Australian cruise around the coast of New Zealand and 28 people died. Yeah. We don't really learn our lessons. Everybody should be getting vaccinated again and again. You know, I've actually had four shots, four vaccinations. What happens if you break the law in space and three times people or governments have tested the rules? In 1967, 112 nations signed the Outer Space Treaty that laid out the foundation for international space law. Space, international space law. How about put that on your legal CV? I'm an expert in international space law. There are no known instances of anyone being charged with committing a crime in space, but there have been three notable times when people have tested the rules. Let's go there. Paolo Rosa Aquino over at businessinsider.com wrote this article. Let's see what the three are. You can go and check out the specifics of it. Hopefully it's enumerated in a way that uh, makes it easy to at least tease you into going over to the article. Russia's anti-satellite missile test created a dangerous cloud of debris. Yeah, now there's shards of debris f whipping around the planet, punching holes and all kinds of stuff. 
cleared of accessing an ex-wife's bank account 240 miles above Earth's surface, NASA astronaut Anne McLean. On December 3rd, 2018, though she was later cleared, McLean was accused of committing the first crime in space in 2019. There's a whole lot more to that, by the way. And uh, the third one was missing a tax deadline due to a last minute space voyage. Jack Swigert in an astronaut suit in 1970, the same year he forgot to file his taxes before leaving on a mission. Hey, send a printer up there, print it out, and then mail it back. Just drop it in a heavily uh, heat resistant box and it'll deorbit eventually. Ultimately, Swigert was granted an extension by the IRS since he was technically out of the country. I didn't know that that was an excuse, even for an extension, like post deadline. But hey, he's an astronaut. Give him some space. <laughs> Get it? Give it. He's an astronaut. Give him some space. Anyway, uh, in the continuity report, that's another channel that talks about movies. I'm actually considering a change to that um, coming in. Um, 2023 January 2023 when I kick off um, five more shows uh, one more a day Wakanda Forever continues Marvel's trend of post credit scenes that mean more to the movie than to the MCU it says here spoiler alert the story contains major spoilers for the end and mid credit scene in Black Panther Wakanda Forever um, currently playing in theaters uh, at the San Diego Comic-Con in July, Marvel Studios chief Kevin Feige told or took to the Hall H stage and for the first time delineated the grand plan for the multiverse saga. I'm going to click this link, but I'm not going to go into anything really. <clears throat> Let me pause this so that it's a video for if you're listening to this via the podcast. Um, I was just about to there's a video playing that I paused. Adam B. Very over at Variety.com wrote this article. And uh, let's see it. Um, I'm going to see. I'm just going to leave that there. You know, that's how I'm going to end today's show. How about that? That might drive a little. Everybody a little nuts. I'm going to leave this here. Wakanda Forever continues Marvel's trend of post credit scenes that mean more to the movie than to the MCU. So how many times have you walked out of a movie theater and then found out later that there were post credit scenes? Most of things associated with the MCU seem to have these post credit scenes. And so I'm going to encourage you to stick around. I'm going to end up buying this. I think we'll see. I have the first black Panther, but I want to be able to just watch these. Well, who knows if I'll be around for grandkids, but um it says here no i don't want to i'm not going to say anything i'm i'm going to leave it alone i'm done let's go back to the front sign of omtown welcome to omtown i am mayor watt that is omtown.com this is the, has been the omtown daily news show for november 12th 2022 be sure to go over to hometown.showbot.tv and vote on the fun articles that you find. And um, where you find articles that are interesting, just vote them up. And uh, I will uh, keep an eye out for more articles of that ilk for particular days. Usually I'm trying to lock things down so that we can um, kind of concentrate on some news on some days. I have not done that um, all year. Uh, I don't know if I will end up doing that or not, but I definitely will be starting five more shows. So it'll go from six o'clock to seven o'clock or whenever it ends. Um, Omtown Daily News Show and then a new show um, afterward for another hour. And uh, we'll we'll go from there. Uh, I don't know what will happen before or after. Um, but around halfway through the year, I will be spending, um, six to eight hours streaming, uh, one thing or another with hometown daily news show and this additional show, uh, whatever the, uh, additional show is each day. Um, 
anchoring the day. So keep that in mind. Hope to see you around. And uh, hometown is a big place. Go check it out. Hometown.com. There's also the podcast. You know, I could just ramble forever. Stay awesome. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you.